Good morning again. Good morning. That's so awesome. I, I just have to say, like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a nocturnal animal. <laughs> Some of you, maybe you can relate, right? So I like, it's hard for me to go to bed at night. It's very hard for me to get up in the morning. I was up before 8 a.m. this morning because I was so excited. I had set an alarm. I didn't need it <laughs> because I was so excited to come here and be with you all this morning and talk about my favorite book. Like, it really felt like Christmas morning. Like, I was just so excited. So, yeah, I'm normally not like this in the morning. I'm just letting you know. (laughs) This is a special day for me. So, um, this is part two of a three-part series on how to experience the Bible. And so, if you, for some reason, you, you, you came into this room, you have no idea what I talked about last week. I am going to give a little summary, but the, the, just the, the details are, are on, online, so please go ahead and take a look at that. Um, and so what, what kind of my intention with last week and this week is what I'm doing is an overview. Um, it's kind of like a, kind of a bird's eye sweeping summary of the entirety of the text of Scripture. And the reason why I'm doing it is, you know, sometimes even if we've been reading the Bible all of our life, um, often we're reading it in very small pieces. And so it, it's, there's a lot of details. <laughs> there's a lot of names. And I know, especially for some of you, like you see those names and you're like, I don't even know how to pronounce this. <laughs> Let alone, like, what does the name mean? What is the significance of this name and all of those kinds of things. And it just, you it, it kind of lose the plot. And so uh, I, I want us to have, kind of be on the same page regarding what is the plot? Like what is going on in this story? Because it'll be helpful when next week we begin to look at like, how do we go now deep? Like we kind of, this is like the wide shot. Then next week we're gonna do a little close up on some specific passages that I'm gonna use as examples of when you employ some of these tools that I talked about last week, looking for problems, looking for patterns, looking for pointers in the text, like what, when I find those things, like what do I do with them? Like what do they actually look like? And so rather than talk theoretically, next week we're gonna look at like concrete examples. Okay, here's the passage, what's going on here? And like, let's unpack the layers and see what we find. So that'll be fun. So definitely come back next week. So um, in our overview, we're about actually the halfway point through the Old Testament. If you are here last week, you know, I, I kind of hate that term. I call it the Hebrew Bible. This old it seems like a pejorative for some reason. Um, and so I'll just quickly sum up. So we, there's three sections of the Hebrew Bible. The, the first one's the Torah. Most people have heard of that. Um, Jesus talks about it a lot. The apostles refer to it a lot. Usually it gets translated in English as law or the law bad translation. Think about it as the teaching. That's really what that means. It's the teaching of Moses. It's five books of teaching. And that's significant too. Like, I don't know how much I'm going to get into like numbers and things in the Bible. Um, But there are patterns in the Bible around numbers. There's there's ways that certain numbers are used over and over and over again. And and when you see it that many times, you know it's not a coincidence. It's, It's a pattern. It's there for a purpose. And so the Bible's kind of training you. This isn't like secret Bible code or anything like that. Like literally, if you just are in the text and you notice these patterns, it's like the Bible's training you. Whenever I see that number, I have this big idea or thought. And, and five is one of those numbers. And, and what I think we're supposed to think when we see five is the idea of Torah or teaching. So you see five things, our question should be, I'm supposed to be learning a lesson from this. The fact that there's five things here, what's that lesson? It's just kind of provoke us to ask more specific questions of the text. That's my thought anyway. Okay, so the Torah, and I'm gonna use this black marker. So I also talked about last week how the difference in how we think between East and West, and you know I used the example of you know Western Western thought is the is linear. This is you know you have you know da 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 da, right? And there's nothing wrong with thinking this way, guys. Just want to be really clear. Like sometimes people think that I, I hate on Western stuff. It's it's not. It's just different. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just different. That's a way of processing information. Um, the, the Eastern way is to like go around in circles. 
you know, circling some, you know, big point in the middle. And, and most of your Bible is, is written toward people that think this way, and, and so it's, it's presenting information in circular fashion. Um, but it's, it's not to say that this doesn't exist anywhere at all. You will see a little bit of this, especially in the New Testament, where the apostles are writing to Western people. God loves Westerners too, so be happy. <laughs> this is, is really um, very clear, very obviously happening. For example, in the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the church at Rome, right? And, and, and who's his audience there, mostly? Romans, <laughs> Roman people who think like this, like who pioneered this, who are, they're the reason you all think like this. Really, it is. It's because of Rome. Think Rome. Like they, they took Greek philosophy and like everything else they took and they built on it and expanded it and put it all over the world. The letter to the Hebrews is written like this. And if you've ever struggled to get through Hebrews like in like one big go, like you're reading Hebrews in little chunks, like if you just read one circle, I think you're like, oh, it's good. But when you read the whole letter, like in one sitting, you get dizzy. That's been my experience, is that he's like, it just keeps circling the same idea. Yeah, right. It's exactly right, because it just reinforces it. This is how we think. And wait, who's the letter written to? Hebrews, <laughs> who are what, what Eastern, right? So it's okay. The Bible's appealing to everybody. It's great. Um, and so uh, the reason I, I went over this again is it's helpful in, in summarizing what I did last week, because when you look at the, the Torah, this is happening from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, you know, it starts, and you can almost think of it like kind of starts at like a small circle, and then the kind of the circles are actually getting bigger as you go on. So the, the, the first small circle is really like Genesis 1, 2, and 3, where you have a people created and, and, and chosen by God with a, with a purpose, with blessing, um, gifting from God to do a thing with him, in partnership with him, and then... Um, they violate their relationship with God, and there's fallout from that. And, and a lot of things come out of that, but one of the things that come out of that is, is they're exiled, and they go east, because that seems to be the direction of exile. And, and so they go east, and they're, they're, they were in the garden, now they're outside the garden, and so like this is kind of the full circle. And then it happens again, very, very quickly, like in Genesis 4, right? Only now it's, it's the next generation, and you have Gain and Havel, and there's these two brothers, and one of them ends up killing the other one, and then what happens to him? Like, this was just a big violation of a relationship, right? You shouldn't murder one another or kill one another. And, and so then there's a fallout from that, and he goes further. And, oh, wait, they're already in exile. Oh, you can get more into exile, like there's degrees. And he goes, what direction? East, again, like, oh, it's like, this is the story we just read, <laughs> right? And it just goes on like that and on like that. And, you know, by the time we get to the end of Genesis now, we have, we've gotten kind of the background information on this, what's become a very large family now living in Egypt. And so then the rest of the Torah, beginning with Exodus, is all about now following this nation of people, Israel. We get to read about how they were born. We get to read about how God um, delivered them, redeemed them, saved them, gave them a purpose and a destiny and blessing and gifts and all of these things. And now we should be, if we've been paying attention to the story, wondering, one of these people going to violate the boundary <laughs> that's going to make them go into exile, right? And that, so now we can go to the next slide, so that brings us to, that's the end of the Torah. We're like on that precipice. They haven't fully done it yet. Uh, but, but Moses is... is is telegraphing that for us. Like, almost like, don't worry, reader, it's coming. Like, I'm just going to prepare your heart in case you thought, maybe this time they'll get it right. No, it's, and it's going to be okay. Um, and so the next, the, the middle section of the Hebrew Bible, which is called the prophets, which again, you're, you're going to see Jesus refer to this section of the Bible all the time, the apostles. Every time Jesus talks about, you know, what is written in Moses and the prophets, this is what he's talking about. He's not just talking about prophets like generic prophetic people from the past. He's actually talking about a specific section of his Bible because that's what they called it. 
They called the first section Torah. They called this Nebim or prophets. It literally just means prophets. Okay, so you can kind of think of, of this, these four books from Joshua to Kings as kind of like this big, large circle. Like this is just Genesis you know, 2 and 3, Genesis 4, written instead of over a chapter or a couple of chapters, over four whole books of this. That's what's happening. You know, Joshua is like them, <clears throat> you know, getting the land in a sense is like getting the garden back. Because what was, what was special about the garden? That there were fruit trees? Go to Indonesia and find fruit trees, right? Like it's, there's lots of fruit trees all over the world. Like what's special about the garden? Okay, well, the tree of life is there and that's very unique. But would, would the garden of Eden still be the garden? if it just had the tree of life, but not God? How important is God in this story? I think he's the deal. Like that's, <laughs> he's the most important character in this whole story, right? And so what was significant about the land was God said, when you settle in the land, like I'm going to live with you in the land. I'm gonna have my own tent. Like you're gonna be able to literally see that my presence is among you. There's gonna be like a holy cloud or a fire over it, you're going to be able to hear my voice speaking to the high priest from the tent of meeting. Like, like people are meeting with me. People are going to come and, and bring their, their complaints and their praise and their worship literally to God's doorstep. And, and like, it's not like, a, like, oh, I have faith that he's really there. No, you can tell he's there. Like there's literally miracles happening audible voice of God being heard like God is literally living with his people that's amazing who wouldn't want to live there right and, and Joshua's about them them getting in there and then you think it's gonna like okay now they're gonna be okay and then ju judges is them like continually violating their relationship with God over and over and over again and each generation they get worse like they go further and and what's God's response he continues to redeem them he continues, like he waits until they ask for help. But when they ask, every single time they ask, he raises someone up from among them, and, which is an important pattern, right? God, God doesn't like descend in a fiery chariot out of heaven. He raises someone up from among them to be their deliverer. That's a pattern that happens over and over again. I wonder if the Bible's trying to teach me something. So that's going on through Judges. And, and throughout Judges, you know, I said this last week, that by the end of the book, like things are getting so bad, even the people that God is raising up, which I assume is like the best of them, like those people, their character is also going down. Like you're thinking maybe this is like literally the best we've got. Someone like Samson, <laughs> who's not a good guy. You not want to have, you know, go out and, and have a coffee with that guy. Like he's just not a stable person. And like Gideon, which, you know, we tell wonderful children's stories about oh, awesome Gideon. Read the whole story. He does some very messed up things, you know, before, during, and after, you know, God using him as, as a redeemer. And so, you know, by the end of the story, you're just like, wow. You could be left with a very cynical, like God's people are just messed up and they're hopeless and they're just bad and sin is just too powerful in our lives, too overwhelming, like you just take it a very negative road. Or you could follow the advice of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and try to have a good eye and look for like what's, what's the good lesson in this story is apparently no matter how bad we get, we're not beyond the grace of God. Because every time they called out, even when they were like the worst of the worst, God answered. He showed up. He rescued them again. He saved them again. No matter how bad they got, God can save them. That's a good story. And that kind of helps me get through Judges um, every time I try to read it. Um, and, then, and then Samuel and Kings are like together, the story of like showing, okay, how they go from this collection of tribes all cohabitating in this piece of real estate and, and actually become a unified nation with a king and... You know, the, the first part of Samuel, they have King Saul, and then Samuel's kind of following this trajectory where we're kind of following Saul's very quick rise and very long fall and descent. And then kind of overlapping that, you see, you know, David's very slow rise and then kind of a very quick fall at the end. And by the time you get to 
Um, that's, that's Samuel. And then Kings is then following like successive generations after David. And we get to see this, this kingdom that has been finally unified um, almost immediately start to break apart. And you have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom and, and it's kind of 10 tribes in the north and two in the south. And, and they're kind of doing their own thing sometimes. Sometimes they're fighting against each other. Sometimes they're, they're, they're united to fight another enemy and then they break off again. Like, it's just, it's really, it's, it's really sad. There's a few, few kings here and there that, that do okay. Uh, very few in the north, a few more in the south. But overall, like if you, if you really pay attention to the pattern, it seems like they get more bad kings than good. And it seems just like in Judges, over time, the, the bad kings get worse and worse and worse. And, and by the end of the story, like you just think, like, is there ever, is ever, God ever going to say enough? Are they ever going to have violated the boundaries of their relationship with him so much and so often and so bad that God finally just says, like, this isn't going to work? And we find the answer, sadly, is yes. Yes. Um, but... Yeah, I'll pause on that. There's, there is a but, but we'll, we'll hold that. Um, and so like the northern kingdom gets taken out first by this big bad empire of Syria. And, and that kind of serves as a warning to the southern kingdom of Judah. Like, hey, maybe we should get our act together. They don't. They don't. And then the next big bad empire on the scene after a series, Babylon. Babylon comes knocking on the door and they lose everything. The city is destroyed. Most of the people are, are carried off into exile. And where do they go? East. Just like, see, see, it's a big circle. Um, and, and like the last lines of Kings, so the last line of this large narrative here, are, you know, just letting us know there's still a descendant of David kicking around. Because we, we had all these prophecies around David and his descendants and promises God made you know, regarding the, this kingdom and how it was about more than God just blessing certain descendants of Abraham, that this is really about God's desire to bless the world, to save the world. And we know at this point in the story that however God's going to do it, it's going to be through partnership with a, a particular son of David who apparently hasn't shown up yet because things just keep getting worse. And so is, is that gone? Is that forfeit? And, and King's ends with, just so you know, there's still some, some kids of David running around, but they're, in, they're slaves and they're going into Babylon. And what's going to happen? Like, that's how the story ends. And so, man, like, what, what do I do with this? You have so many questions, right? And I really love that if you just read like the, the books of Moses and then read these four, you've pretty much got the majority, like 90% of the whole story of the Hebrew Bible, just right there. Like that's the whole thing. Everything else is just add in more, more spice and flavor and a, a few more details. So, but, but the prophets aren't done yet. We actually have four more books of the prophets. Oh, I have this. I forgot about that. Oh, wait, no. There we go. So I, I call the first four prophetic narrative, the second four prophetic commentary. Because what Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the book of the 12 are doing is, is they're not necessarily trying to just tell you the story all over again. What they're trying to do, is, I think, is help you to process this very heavy story you just read. Like, what in the world you know, like, why did God allow this to happen and over hundreds of years? And, you know, if, if God knew all the way back in Moses that this thing wasn't going to work, why even bother, <laughs> right? Like, what, what do we do with this story? And how do we try to understand God and, and his heart and his strategy, his plan, you know, whatever that might be for the world? Like, how do we make sense of all that? And so these four books are, are kind of a meditation on the story from a, a prophetic some very some some different prophetic voices you know isaiah is primarily kind of looking at this story and and like the 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 chief the climactic event in the story cataclysmic event in the story is the exile itself right and so that's like the thing i think if i was a jewish person um living in the time of Jesus, like that would be the thing that I'd really want to try to understand and process, like how did that whole exile thing. And, and so Isaiah's looking at it from like pre-exile, like looking, looking at it as kind of a future thing and kind of prophetically calling out the things that are going on in, in the kingdom 
that are making exile inevitable. And, and a lot of what it is, is it's not just that the people are sinning. Because remember the book of Judges, right? Like God actually can handle our sin. Like he can still, we can't sin so much that God is just like, I can't do anything with you. Apparently he can. He can work through very broken, very messed up um, people. But what Isaiah reminds us, the reader, is that, again, God's not setting up Israel to be a paradise for Jewish people, <laughs> Like, that's not the point of, of, of Israel. The point of Israel is it is supposed to be a, a holy people. And what does holy mean? It means set apart for a special purpose. And what's their special purpose? To be a light to the nations. That's what Gentiles means, is nations. And so they're supposed to be a light, a light showing what? A light drawing people's eyes to what? To what it looks like when people actually live with God. When people actually, like, yield their desires, when they, they yield their, their, their will um, and their authority back to the one that it really belongs to, which is God. It's supposed to be a place, and you think about where God chose, if he's going to choose anywhere on the planet, he chose this crossroads piece of, look, of real estate between Africa, Europe, and Asia, like right where those three big continents meet, so that people that are passing through, just going about their lives, doing their economic trades, whatever, they have to pass through this little tiny place where people are different. They dress different. They talk different. Their God is different. They only have one God. And, and how they, like this is the ideal, the, like how they treat their neighbors are different, how they care for the poor is different, how they look after the fatherless, the widow, how they treat foreigners is so different. There's something different about these people. And, and to get them to notice and want to dig deep, like what makes these people different? Oh, they have the written down words, the story of God. And reading this story and meditating on this story and trying to live out the principles of this story in, and not just from like a, you know, arm's length away from the God, like they're just reading about him like in a science book, but like doing that in relationship with their God. Because they can go to Jerusalem and they're actually required to three times a year to come and meet with their God and remember that they're actually, even though they're all these different tribes, they're one family with one father in heaven. Like it's amazing. It's amazing. But what happens when, when people are passing through Israel and they have fallen so far and so hard that actually, it's not that they're actually just so bad. They're just like everybody else now. Their nation is just as bad and just as idolatrous and just as sinful as everybody around them. And so now they're no longer holy. They're no longer special. There's nothing to notice. Where's God in the story? He's faded into the background. And that's what God can't allow to continue. Because it's not just about Israel. God has on his heart to save the world. And if his partner in saving the world isn't interested anymore in that, like, we got to reboot. <laughs> we got to start over. And that's what the exile is about. And that's what all three, like when you we read Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, like they're all looking at it, you know, before the exile, Jeremiah's looking at what did it look like to go through the exile, like to be in Jerusalem while Babylon's laying siege to the walls, like all of that, that trauma. And then Ezekiel, like, okay, now we're in exile. What just happened? Where is God? They, I heard they just destroyed the temple. Like, was God at home? No, he wasn't. Um, didn't bother him at all. Um, and it, it's true. Like, at the beginning of Ezekiel, we see this dramatic prophetic vision of God's chariot throne departing the temple pausing just briefly on the Mount of Olives before ascending into the sky. I wonder what's up with that. I wonder if that's foreshadowing. Anyway, um, like those three. And then the Book of the Twelve, um, don't, don't be alarmed that you don't see the Book of the Twelve um, as such in your Bible. It's actually all there. The, the text, the content is all still there. It's Hosea through Malachi. So those 12 books, count them, right? In Jesus' day, they would have been on one scroll and, and treated as one book with 12 kind of big chapters with these different prophetic names over them. We don't normally read the 12 that way today. It's a shame because if you do, wow, some of those books will hit you very differently 
than they ever have before. You'll notice um, shared themes, patterns. You'll notice when the, when the author intentionally breaks the pattern of the books that have come before, like Jonah, for example, like where you have all these successive books of, you know, the word of the Lord came to such and such, and this is what he said. The word of the Lord came to such and such, and this is what he said. And you have, you have a few of these, and you get to Jonah, and the word of the Lord came to, you know, Jonah, son of Amittai, and Jonah got up and ran away. <laughs> and you're like, why is the pattern broken? And then you find, like, Jonah, like, every pattern is going to get broken. Like, this is, like, it's not a lullaby trying to bring you to sleep. Like, it's trying to show you something. And it's, it's really profound. And then it kind of goes back. And, and so that's what's going on um, in the 12. And again, like, there, there, there's a few books in there where we're seeing a little bit, little hints of more narrative. Like, the story's not over in Babylon. You get a little bit of, well, some Jews are eventually going to go back and try to re- rebuild some stuff in Jerusalem. And just some kind of hints of that. But for the most part, there's not a lot of new historical information in these books, but it is giving us more to think about and, and teaching us how to think about this story. Okay, and then that brings us to the, the next and, and the final section of the Hebrew Bible, which is the, the Ketubim, the writings. This is a name, by the way, the Ketubim that came after the time of Jesus, they weren't using this word to talk about the third section. Um, as far as we can tell, there, there wasn't yet a unified name for this collection. And so um, people either just didn't say, they just said Moses and the prophets, and people knew, and, and that there's other stuff too. Um, sometimes they would say Torah, prophets, and Psalms, because the Psalms are the first book, and everyone knows the Psalms and, and everything that follows. Um, and so the, the writings are everything else that we haven't talked about yet in the Hebrew Bible. And I kind of divide it out like this way. This is, again, the, the Torah has a very set order. The prophets have a very set intended order. The writings, like there's certain books in here that obviously meant to go together. But, you know, how, how we read these as a whole collection, I think, is, is a little more open. Like you, you don't have to necessarily read in this order. But I, I've grouped them this way. So... Because Psalms, Proverbs, and Job, they are all written in a very specific style of Hebrew poetry. So they kind of naturally get collected together. Um, Psalms always seems to be the, the first book that most people will list in this collection. And I think it's, it's helpful because Psalms, like if you really pay attention to how Psalms begins, it seems like it's trying to like grab a hold of the narrative thread of Torah and the narrative thread of the prophets and like pull them forward and pull you it long forward to where it wants to take that story next. So like Psalm 1 is really almost a, a poetic summary of Torah. If you go back and read Psalm 1 again, it's a prophetic summary of what the whole Torah is about, which is, you know, the person that, that meditates on Torah is like a tree of life. <gasps> what? <laughs> that's pretty wild. Um, that's what I was supposed to get from the Torah. Psalms is like, yeah, and I, I waited till now to tell you that, so you'll go back and reread it now. Um, and then Psalm 2 is, is kind of a summary of the prophets, and it's about the son of David, who's God's son, who's going to rule the world. I'm supposed to get that from the prophets, like that that's that's the inevitable end of this story. And, and Psalms is like, yeah, you didn't get that when you read it. Go back and read it again. And then come back. And now we can read the rest of Psalms. And I, I know a lot of us, um, if you, you've spent a long time in church, and, and the way that we tend to um, today interact with the book of Psalms, we kind of treat it like this is just the hymn book of the Jewish people because um, it's just full of, you know, 150 songs. And they have some kind of order to them, but the order probably isn't super significant. Um, and if you really pay attention, like when you've ever read through the book of Psalms, you might notice that there's actually discrete sections of Psalms. Like there's book one, book two, book three, book four, book five. Oh, there's five books. I'm sure that's a coincidence, right? By this point in the story, we haven't been, like, we see five, we think, eh, it's just a random number. Um, or, or Psalms is trying to teach you something. And the order of these songs has been very carefully selected and arranged to teach you something. And if you've never had that thought before, that's okay, because that's not how we talk about Psalms, unfortunately. 
But there's been a lot of scholarship. We live in a great age, by the way, for Bible scholarship. Like there's just so many, like for me, like, like just earth shattering, shattering revelations coming out of people that are going back and asking these kinds of questions um, seemingly for the first time in hundreds of years. And it's, been, it's born a lot of fruit. And so people going back and looking, um, is that how people in Jesus' day viewed the book of Psalms? And they found out, no, not at all. People saw the book of Psalms as like an opera. Yeah, it's set to music, it has lyrics, but it's a story. The book of Psalms is telling a story. Well, what's the story? Like if we had actors on a stage singing psalms, like in costumes and all of that, like what would, like what would the story be? And again, this is Jews in the first century in Jesus' day who were, you know, their Bible, Bible scholars reading and meditating on it. Well, they said, well, here, it's really simple. The story of the book of Psalms is that You know, the sin of God's people is going to become so great that God is going to have to send a Messiah. And God sends Messiah. He's going to be rejected by his own people. He is going to be handed over by the Jewish leaders to pagan Gentiles. He'll be killed outside the walls of Jerusalem. And on the third day, he'll rise again and reign forever. Hallelujah. That's the book of Psalms. That's the story. That's why Jesus could say with a straight face when people are, you know, eyes bugging out like saucers post his resurrection, like, what's going on? And he's like, did you not read your Bible? And he even says in in, in Luke 24, he says, did you not read Psalms? He he calls out Psalms. Like, and he he says, did it not say that the Son of Man was going to be handed over to the pagans and crucified and on the third day rise again? Here I am. Just like the Bible says, this is not, should not have shocked you, should not have surprised you. And it turns out that that is, and so there's whole, there's books lately that have been coming out, like analyzing this and saying, is that, like, because we, we found evidence in Jewish writings and Jewish commentaries, you know, dating back, you know, 1,500 years plus, that they really thought that. They really thought that. Now, why didn't they get Jesus? That's a whole other story. But I I can tell you, because I've read those sources myself now, that even hundreds of years after Jesus, they were waiting for the Messiah to come, be killed by the Gentiles outside of Jerusalem, and rise again on the third day. Seriously. And if you want to get me to the side somewhere later, I'll tell you how that's actually how Islam became what it was, because somebody mistook somebody else for that figure. They were still, literally 600 years after Jesus, they were still waiting for the fulfillment of that specific story. Yeah, mind-blowing, right? So that's the book of Psalms um, in a nutshell. And so then, you know, Proverbs and Job are really, you know, analyzing this idea of like, what does it mean to be wise? How, you know, how should we be living in this world in light of like that God exists and he wants a relationship with us and the world is so messed up and broken and it seems like if you do the right thing, you get punished for it. You do the wrong thing, you get rewarded for it. But, you know, like I only have one life to live. Like how do I navigate this? And, and why do good things seem to happen to bad people? <laughs> and why do terrible things seem to happen to good people? Like all of that, like Proverbs and Job are tackling that issue from two different angles, um, and I'm just going to stop myself there because I can just go on and on about how cool that is. So then the next section um, that I like to talk about in the writings um, are the scrolls that go with this, some sacred days on the Jewish calendar. Um, they have a, a specific name in Hebrew, um, the, uh, the Mechilot, um, but really that, that's not important. Like what, What's important is that there's five of them. <laughs> Huh, is that a coincidence? <laughs> and they're each, each one is associated, embedded in, in one of five different sacred days on the Hebrew calendar. And, and what that meant practically, if you grew up Jewish or you were you know, a, a, a Hebrew person in Jesus' day, is you could expect if you were a regular synagogue attender, you were going to hear these five every single year on these specific days. You go to synagogue on that, during that feast or during that sacred day, you're going to hear the book that goes with that. They're going to read the whole thing in one sitting right there in front of you in the synagogue. So what are, what are they associated with? Um, well, Song of Songs, which is, you know, one we don't preach on very often, right? Because it's a little too, it's erotic love poetry. 
Um, but you would, if, again, in Jesus' day, you would get to hear it spoken from the very center of the synagogue every year during Passover. Passover, because the Jews believed that this was a bit of a, a prophetic commentary, a, a devotion on the story of the Exodus. Like this is what the Exodus meant to God. It was a love story. It was powerful. It was intimate. And that's what Song of Songs is. And the implication then is for us today, looking back, is that means while Jesus, when our our Lord and our Savior, our Messiah, was hanging from a cross, bleeding, suffering, struggling to breathe, pierced for us, Jewish people all over Israel on that t- during that time were listening to the Song of Songs being read. And you think about, like, the Lord could have chosen, no, nobody took Jesus' life away from him. He laid it down. And he could have chosen to lay it down on any day of the year he wanted. He and the Father agreed. And this was the day that they chose. Like, this is the day that helps people understand why I'm doing this. And it's about intimate marital love. That's what it's about. Okay. Movie next, and I've kind of arranged these a little bit according to the calendar. So what comes after Passover is Pentecost is the next big day, Shavuot, um, this, the, the sevens, the Feast of Sevens, because it's seven sevens after Passover. And, and it's originally like that, what that feast is commemorating is the giving of Torah, meeting with God on Mount Sinai um, for the church, because it just so happens on that very same day is when God poured out his spirit on all sons and daughters and and, and indwelled us with his very presence. And, and what were people reading on, on that Shabbat, on, on, on that Saturday in, in the synagogue? They were reading Ruth, which is, again, is a very romantic story, a love story. Um, but it's about, you know, God's people and the foreigner coming together into one family. That's not weird or bad or wrong, but actually the, the beginning and the origin story of God's intended kingdom because we find out at the end of Ruth that that's David, this is David's family story. That that's what, this is the family that produced King David that we all love and adore and admire, right? And, and Ruth is about that and that it's something about nations being brought together and grafted in to God's people and God's family. And you think about how God's word was doing that for the people before Jesus and now we have the word and God's spirit now doing that. The fact that most of us in here probably are Gentiles is proof that the Holy Spirit did what Boaz did for Ruth in in grafting us in to a family story that originally wasn't ours but now it's become our story and now their God is our God, right? It's so beautiful. Um, And then the middle book, Lamentations, there. So the others are all talking about kind of celebratory days. This is the one day that's, it's a sacred day in the Hebrew calendar, and they observe it very solemnly and powerfully every single year, uh, but it's not a happy time. Um, Lamentations is read every year during the ninth day of the month of Av or Ab. And what's special about that day? It's the day that the temple... God's house in Jerusalem was destroyed by pagans. Very sad day. And, and not sad because it was a great loss f- for God, sad because it's a great loss for God's people because of what that symbolized, the brokenness of their relationship with him. And so Lamentations is a book that m- prophetically meditates on the experience of grief and repentance and anger and, and sorrow and regret, all of those things. It's a book that teaches us how to grieve, which I feel like, just can be real, like I think in Western culture, I think you might need some help with that, like how to grieve as a spiritual community and not just like, oh, it'll be okay, whatever. Like, no, like let's sit in our grief. Let's put on sackcloth and sit in ashes and cry and wail about the horror that we are experiencing. And Lamentations teaches us how to do that. And you might say, well, which which temple? Because weren't there two temples? Yeah. Both of them were destroyed on the same day of the year, on the 9th of Av. I think that's a coincidence. The Jewish people didn't think so. I think there's something about this day f- for all history that it's marked by this. Okay, then Ecclesiastes. So then the next major feast um, is um, Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booths, whatever you want to call it. Um, Sukkot in Hebrew. 
and Ecclesiastes. So what's that, what's that thing? Oh, that's the one where they go out and they kind of go camping with their family and they build these little shelters and they do all this stuff that reminds them of when they were in the wilderness with God. And here's this book, Ecclesiastes, which is a little odd, but it, it, it's about living in the wilderness with God in a way. You know, and, and looking for wisdom in a world where everything feels meaningless, everything is havel, everything is empty, everything is vain or void or whatever, however you want to try to translate that difficult Hebrew word. Um, and, and so, like, what's the point of anything? What's the point of life? What's the point of existence? Um, if, if, our, if our sinful inclination is real and everything we do is getting, like, should we bother trying? Like, you know, if... if, if if, if our efforting doesn't you know, seem to make a difference, if, if the good people always win, like kind of has a lot of strong ties, by the way, with Proverbs and Job. You kinda, I kind of look at those three as kind of sitting around a table having a conversation about like what it looks like to try to live, real, like really live in this world. And Ecclesiastes is the guy sitting there smoking a cigarette saying like, yeah, it's just it's smoke, it's nothing, right? Uh, but the important thing to remember at Eccle- Ecclesiastes is it has an intro and an outro. And so the main voice that takes up the bulk of it is not actually the narrator. There's somebody else who's telling us about this is what this preacher preached on. And I want you, I'm going to share it with you. And then at the end, he's like, and hey, so this is what you just heard in the preacher. It's some heavy stuff. It's some uh, maybe depressing, cynical stuff. But there are some good things in there. And this is what I want you to pick out. And, and there's some other things that, you know, like that, he's just expressing what we all feel, and it's okay to it's okay to say that. It's okay to acknowledge that. And at the end of the day, you just need to like fear God, like walk with Him, like live as if God is real and it matters, even if it doesn't seem like it. And so it's always important when we read Ecclesiastes, don't just read like one chapter and like I'm going to live my life on this. Like read the whole book and get the how it all fits together. And the final one, Esther. That's the most obvious one. Esther is read every year during the holiday of Purim. And Esther's the story. If you're like, what's Purim? Read Esther. <laughs> like, it's literally like, how did they get that holiday? Well, there was this one time, you know, back when we were exiles in, in Persia. And, you know, some guy wanted to pick a date. He rolled some, some Purim, some dice, some lots, and cast lots to decide on this day, I'm going to genocide all the Jewish people. And then God's like, no. Anyway, it's, it's a wild story. And uh, again, this one I could say so much about, but that's, that's, it's, it's basically a story where every year they're now celebrating that on the day that God's enemies wanted to destroy his people, God not only saved them, but elevated them, blessed them, um, and gave them victory over their enemies um, miraculously. Okay, and so then that leaves off the final three books of the writings, which are um, narrative, again, so this kind of like brings the story like finally full circle. You know, we kind of were left hanging in kings and the prophets, you know, the Jewish people sitting off in exile. Is this really the end of the story? The prophets seem to be saying, no, God still will do something. And so what's God going to do? Well, it starts off with Daniel. Here we get, we get kind of this insider perspective on what it was like to be snatched from your home by Babylon, to be made a slave, and essentially a cog in the Babylonian machine that just destroyed and annihilated your people, and now you have a government job, and you get to work (laughs) for the government that just destroyed your people, and, and leveled the house of God, and all of those things, and like dealing with even just the ethics of like, is that okay for, you know, pagans to come and give you new clothes, a new name, a new job, a new identity? Like, should I just resist? Should I fight? And, and if I submit, like, how much is too much? Like, what does, do I draw the line? And Daniel's exploring. And most people think of Daniel for the prophetic stuff, which is definitely a part of it, but it's only half the story. The prophetic stuff is coming out of Daniel's life, which is a life that is lived uncompromising in his allegiance to Yahweh, but at the same time obeying the words of Jeremiah to like plant trees and get comfortable in Babylon because you're going to be here a while, and that maybe God can still use you for good from inside the evil empire. Maybe like this exile doesn't have to be just a time out. Maybe we can actually still participate in the mission of God to reach all people through Babylon. Would that be something? 
And so Daniel's exploring all of that and then also gives us some really powerful prophetic images of, of where the story is going to end up and how God is going to do something so miraculous that he's going to turn the world upside down. And all these evil empires that are depicted as raging beasts are trampled beneath the feet of one like a son of man. Who's that? Right? And so then Ezra and Nehemiah, which are meant, they're one book that would have been on one scroll in Jesus' day. The fact that we split them is unfortunate. You should read them together as if they're one complete story because that's, that's how they were designed. Ezra and Nehemiah is the story of uh, the people of God um, are finally like starting to get permission to go back and, and rebuild. And it is not a return from exile. I think sometimes it can be easy to misunderstand the story as if, okay, now all the Jews are coming back to the land. No, that's not what's happening. It's a remnant. It's a seed. It's just a tiny little amount. The majority, by the end of Nehemiah, most of the Jews, and, and this was still true in Jesus' day, guys, most of the Jewish people still live outside the land of Israel. They haven't come back. Why? Variety of reasons, but one of the primary ones is they're waiting for God to come back because there's no point in living in the land without God. It's not the garden without God. Even if they're free, even if legally they can go and return and build homes and whatever, majority of them, even to this day, are not living in the land of Israel. And some of them because they become secular and they're just not concerned about that. But I've talked to a lot of religious Jews who say, I'm not going back till Messiah comes. There's no point. There's no point in getting caught up in that mess until God is home again. So that's what's going on in Ezra and Nehemiah. There's a small remnant, though. They're like, well, we got to get things ready for Messiah. We got to get things ready for God. Like, we can't all live in exile. Like, somebody's got to be there to hold the welcome home sign when God comes back. And so it's a story of like several different people doing their very best. They're, none of them are villains. Um, but I, I read this story as a story of, of human beings with good intentions trying to do their best to make a home for God in this world and failing spectacularly. You have, you know, one idea is, well, we don't have a temple. God's going to need a house when he comes back, so let's rebuild the temple, and they try to rebuild the temple, and, and, and the Ezra narrative, when they finally finish it, and there's some struggle to do that, they finally finish it. It's so pathetic looking only the young people are excited because <laughs> they've never seen anything like it before. So to them, it's cool. But the older people are literally weeping, silent, like they can't even be excited. They can't cheer. They're crying because they're like, we remember what Solomon's temple looked like. And it was not this. This is sad. This is pathetic. This isn't good enough. And so it ultimately feels like a failure. And so then, well, maybe, it's not, maybe the house isn't the big deal. You know, maybe the whole reason we went into exile to begin with is we didn't actually know the Bible. <laughs> we didn't read God's word. We didn't live it. And so this guy um, shows up, and um, Ezra, the, the first half of the book is named after, Ezra shows up, and he's a Bible scholar. Like, he's awesome. And when he gets in, he gathers all the people in the, one of this, this big town square in Jerusalem, and he just reads to them and preaches the Torah to them from, from morning to afternoon. And nobody gets tired, nobody gets cranky. They sit there and just enwrapped, at times weeping over the beauty and the glory of the Word of God. And they're like, this is what we've been missing our whole lives. We didn't know the story. And so by the end of it, they're like, we're going to live the Bible now. Like, we were ignorant before, but now we have no excuse, and we're going to do it because we have the Bible. Um, and how does that turn out? Like, literally, it doesn't even take, like, a generation. Like, literally a few years later, they're, like, breaking all the laws they promised not to break. You know, Nehemiah comes in, and he's like, oh, like, how can this be a capital of, of God's kingdom on earth? It's like the walls are down, everything's disorganized, like there's no government, like I'm gonna come in and organize and administrate and build walls and it's gonna be great and we're gonna feel protected from our enemies and maybe more people will come back if they feel safe because a wall makes you feel safe. And, and he tries to do that and there's all this conflict and he fights through it and he's, again, I don't think he's a villain. I think he's a, a good man who loves God and, and wants to do the right thing and he builds this wall and he thinks everything's great. And then by the end of the book, he comes back to check everything. And this is where you find out, like, everything's falling apart. The wall that he built, they got merchant stalls built into it now so people can buy and sell on the Sabbath. Because who cares? You know, 
people, the, the priests, like nobody's even like giving to the storehouse of the, the temple, which is supposed to be the place where the poor and the widows and the orphans get fed and it's empty. And the priests have turned the temple into an Airbnb. Literally, like there are people that can come in and you can stay in the temple of God. We've got all these rooms because we're not using them for anything. It's a temple. And Nehemiah loses it. And at the end of the, like the last chapter of the book is him running through Jerusalem and he's grabbing people by the beard and punching them in the face. So mad. So mad. And crying out like, God, remember me. I did my best. It's not my fault. It's these people. They're, they're hopeless. It's depressing, right? And so, like, what are we supposed to take away from that story? Well, whatever it is, is that I, I think among many things is that whatever it looks like to bring revival, to um, restore God's, God's divine presence with his people and be um, his kingdom, and his people truly again, it's not gonna happen from building projects. It's not gonna happen from bringing in the best charismatic, most gifted Bible teachers. It's not gonna come from building secure safety, having great administration, all of, apparently those things are not what God just needs to build his kingdom. Those are not bad things, but they're not what God's, God needs to build his kingdom. Well, what is it, right? And so now we have the last book, um, which is Chronicles. And this is where Chronicles belongs, my friends. It does not belong right after Kings in your Bible because nobody's ever going to read Chronicles after they just read Samuel and Kings. It's not going to happen. You're going to skip it. I know you. Because I know myself. Because that's what I used to do. Like when I was a new believer and trying to read through the Bible, I was like, I've read all this stuff before. Why am I going to read it? But at the very end of the Hebrew Bible, as the last book, of the scriptures as they existed when Jesus came, this is the perfect place of it. Because by now, you've had 23 stories, 23 scrolls of some pretty heavy, intense story. And like, where do I walk away from all of this? How do I take all of these? Like, what's the, the single thread? What's the summary? What's the takeaway? Chronicles is giving us that. And isn't it interesting? Because Chronicles, if you pay attention to like, is that really what Chronicles is doing? It's a summary of the entire Hebrew Bible? Yeah, and it's telling you that in the text subversively because what's the first, in, 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 uh, in Chronicles, what's the first word in the Hebrew text? Now, some of your English translations, you know, they might put it in a different order. But the very first word is Adam, <laughs> which points us all the way back to Genesis chapter one, right? And then you kind of read through the whole story of Chronicles and all of this, and what's the last sentence of the book of Chronicles? This would be second Chronicles. Don't worry about first, second. It's just two parts to one scroll because the scroll was so big, they had to break it up in two, but it's meant, like if they could have put it all on just one, they would have. Um, the last is the, is the first sentence of Ezra, which is the very last thing you should have read. The last book was Ezra and Nehemiah. So it's literally taking you from Genesis to Ezra and Nehemiah. Now when I say it's, it ends with the first sentence, that's not 100% true because if you look, and, and the one nice thing is in our Bibles, they do put Chronicles and Ezra next to each other. So you can really easily flip your page and check this. The author of Chronicles, and there's all kinds of theories on who that is, that I won't get into, could have copied that first sentence. He doesn't. He literally stops abruptly in the middle of the sentence, and that's how Chronicles ends. Which is an interesting, if you're a writer, if you're a creative writer, that's a very interesting decision to make, to just stop in the middle of the sentence. Almost to say, because remember, I just, I just summarized Ezra and Nehemiah. Like, it's a frustrating story with an open question, what is it gonna take? And you get to Ezra and Nehemiah, and it's just like, it's like, nope, dot, dot, dot. Whatever it is, it's not gonna be that. It's gonna be something else. What we're missing is gonna be something else. And this is the perfect, and, and it, uh, if you read Chronicles, there's a real focus 
on David and the line of David being really, really significant to God's purposes. And this, Chronicles, is the perfect place to leap and turn the page and find the Gospel of Matthew waiting for you, which picks up with a genie. Like, it's just so perfect. It's so perfect. Okay, we're out of time. My brother's going to come up. So we will, we've left off. We still have the New Testament. So I'll, I'll finish up real briefly the New Testament next week, and then we will dig in deep into some specific stories and show how we can go and uncover the beautiful, amazing treasures of God in this amazing, wonderful book. All right, let's give Nasser a hand. Thank you. Man.